We have neglected to discuss an essential type of in infrastructure that can have devastating impacts uh, on coastal com communities. Over the past six weeks, offshore and gas infrastructure, abandoned, active, and just plain old, has been the source of multiple oil leaks in the Gulf of Mexico. And an active pipeline was the source of a leak off the California, off the Southern California shore. In late August, Hurricane Ida uh, tore through the Gulf, killing scores of people and knocking out power, water, and communication. Residents are still recovering today. But Ida also caused multiple offshore oil spills. Active pipelines and platforms were the sources of some spills, while abandoned ones with no identifiable party to take responsibility were the source of others. According to reports, Ida triggered the most Gulf oil spills identified from space following a weather event since the government started tracking leaks and spills using satellites almost a decade ago. We shouldn't view this as a one-off event or a freak accident. There are thousands of oil and gas structures in the Gulf, including rigs, platforms, wellheads, power cables, and thousands of miles of pipeline, all potentially posing environmental and safety risks. Some of this infrastructure is active and some is abandoned, but it's all aging and a growing concern for communities and wildlife impacted by spills and also taxpayers that may be forced to pay for its eventual removal. As climate change supercharges storms in the Gulf, more powerful winds, waves, currents, and mudslides will be a growing threat, capable of moving pipelines and destroying structures. Stronger federal regulations of this offshore infrastructure is essential to reduce future spills and other impacts and to protect taxpayers from shouldering the cleanup costs. But this isn't just a huge and growing problem in the Gulf of Mexico. As Californians have re recently experienced, there is also a crisis in the Pacific. On October 1, residents around uh, Huntington Beach and Newport Beach reported oily smells, and the EPA National Response Center received reports of an unknown sheen on the water surface. The Coast Guard confirmed a spill the next day, and since then, local, state, and federal officials and volunteers have organized a robust response to contain and clean up the oil spill and to begin to investigate the causes. Over the past two weeks, we have learned considerable details about the San Pedro Bay Pipeline Amplified Energy, Amplify Energy's response and the timeline of events that led to the rupture. It appears that months ago, a ship's anchor may have hooked and dragged the pipeline over 100 feet, damaging it and causing the slash that led to the release of tens of thousands of gallons of oil. But all of this begs several questions and it raises issues for us. Did the pipeline move or become unsecure from the seafloor? creating a hazard for commercial vessels? Was the pipeline inspected correctly in recent years as required? And were there indications of issues? And was there a delay between when the alarm went off 
and when Amplify initiated their emergency response plan. While these and many other questions must be answered, it will be, take time. But in the interim, we need to learn more about the immediate and long-term impacts of the spill, because there are many. As we know, beaches and fishing spots have been closed, although recently some have begun to be reopened. Local businesses, vendors, and restaurants have seen customers vanish. Wetlands that serve as a refuge for shorebirds and other wildlife have been inundated with oil and tar balls. As part of the spill investigation, we need to hear from residents and the surrounding communities on the ground. That's precisely why Congresswoman Porter and I are having a joint field hearing this coming Monday in Southern California. The response to the spill will continue and conditions will eventually improve and hopefully have started, but it's critical that we don't simply move on and wait for the next accident to occur. Offshore oil and gas infrastructure, both in the Gulf and in, and, and in the Pacific is a ticking time bomb and the California spill is part of a much larger disaster in the making. Congress has known that offshore infrastructure poses risks to the environment and taxpayers for years. 2015, the Government Accountability Office alerted us that taxpayers are on the hook for billions of dollars in offshore decom decommissioning costs. And in April, the GAO released a scathing report detailing the extensive failures of the Interior Department's oversight of offshore pipelines in the Gulf of Mexico. The recent offshore spills need to be a wake-up call for Congress because without stronger regulations, things will get worse and coastal communities and taxpayers will pay a steeper and steeper price. With that, I look forward to the testimony of our, of our witnesses, and I now recognize Ranking Member Stauber for his opening remarks. Welcome, Ms. Representative Stauber. Thank you, uh, Chairman Lowenthal. The Biden administration's policies have created crisis after crisis. Americans and other innocents died in Afghanistan due, a, due to a poorly planned extrication. Illegal immigrants flooding our borders because every Democrat during the presidential election put their hand in the air when asked if they would support health care for all illegals. The Department of Justice targeting parents who had the audacity to disagree with elected officials in their communities. The ballooning inflation, weakening supply chains, Americans paying more for less. Every single day is more expensive than the prior day. And most pertinent to this subcommittee is Joe Biden's self-imposed energy crisis. Fortunately, the Carter administration and gas shortages that hurt working families is something that my children aren't familiar with. Unfortunately, Joe Biden seems hell-bent on creating his own energy crisis to rival that of President Carter's. America's children will have to live through a similar, if not worse, stagnate, stagnating economy. On day one of this administration, within five hours of his inauguration, Joe Biden elected to halt construction of the Keystone XL pipeline. Shortly thereafter, Joe Biden issued an unlawful ban on oil and gas development. Therefore, energy prices went up then and are going up now. This is simple supply and demand. It is not that hard to comprehend. And after taking months to realize his mistake, Joe Biden dispatched his Lieutenant, Minnesota native and National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, to beg OPEC to pump more oil. And this was back in August. That's right. Joe Biden does not believe our workforce is good enough to produce energy for our citizens, but he believes OPEC's is. Believe it or not, 
Mr. Chair, OPEC recently informed Biden and our nation that no, their member countries, that includes Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Russia, and other foreign adversaries, will not pump more oil to cover for Biden's mistakes. So what is he doing? Along with maybe a folksy stroll to a local ice cream shop, he finally started he finally started a dialogue with folks from the oil and gas sector to discuss how they can help lower gas prices. Although we can't be clear on what exactly was discussed, I can certainly provide a summary of things that will help keep energy prices down. Issue onshore and offshore lease sales, reinstate the presidential permit for the Keystone Exo pipeline, renew our commitment to exporting American energy instead of importing foreign energy, reform a broken permitting process, and stop burdening domestic producers. I stand ready and able, Mr. Chair, for, the President, for President Biden to discuss with Congress these solutions to his self-imposed crisis. Just say the word and we can send a joint letter asking President Biden to withdraw his revision of Trump's NEPA regulations or to end the master leasing program. Meanwhile, you will not find disagreement from me that we need to protect our environment. There is not a single Republican here that is not a conservationist. We believe in funding our national parks and public lands, the Great American Outdoors Act, for example, which is invested through offshore and gas revenues. We believe in robust fisheries and passing the tradition of being sportsmen and sportswomen along to our children, helped by offshore infrastructure providing robust habitat. And we believe in holding those that do pollute accountable. The Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement has in recent years worked closely with industry to continue improving safety. Just this past year, the Government Accountability Office removed offshore and, and gas from its high risk list due to strides made in safety. However, we draw a hard line on vilifying an entire industry that employs hardworking Americans earning high quality wages and lets you and I put affordable gasoline in our vehicles. So for today's hearing, I recognize that many will use the recent events in California to argue for outright banning oil and gas development or nickel and diming folks in the industry out of a job. I know my Republicans and my Republican colleagues and I eagerly await more information. So far, we know that the Associated Press, informed by the U.S. Coast Guard, reported that an anchor being dragged is the most likely cause at this moment. We also know that Biden's bottleneck is strangling supply chains and forcing these ships to anchor for too long. Instead, I know my Democrat colleagues today will continue to speculate. The last their witnesses joining us today for their opinion about why the evil oil and gas sector is to blame. Dancing around the fact that policies propo proposed by this very body will only make this crisis worse. In closing, I do look forward to a constructive dialogue. I look forward to pressing our witnesses on how we can escape another and self-imposed crisis with responsible policy making in our energy sector. Mr. Chair, I yield back, thank you. Thank you, Ra Ranking Member Stauber. Uh, I will now introduce today's witnesses. Dr. Donald Bosch is a professor of marine science and the uh, president emeritus of the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. Dr. Bosch is also a former member of the National Commission on the BP Deepwater Horizon Oil Spill and Offshore Drilling. Rob Schuert is the North American Executive Director of the Carbon Tracker Initiative. Jacqueline Sabitz is the Chief Policy Officer for North America at Oceana. And Dr. Greg Stuns is the Endowed Chair for Fisheries and Ocean Health at the Heart Research Institute for Gulf of Mexico Studies. 
Let me remind the witnesses that under our committee rules, they must limit their oral statements to five minutes, but that their entire statements will appear in the hearing record. When you begin, the timer will begin, and it will turn orange when you have one minute remaining. I recommend that members and witnesses joining remotely use, quote, stage view so they may pin the timer on their screen. After your testimony is complete, please remember to mute yourself to avoid any inadvertent background noise. I will allow the entire panel to testify before questioning the witnesses. The chair now recognizes Dr. Bosch for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Lowenthal and Ranking Member Stauber. Uh, from the time I was first conducting research on environmental effects of offshore oil and gas in the Gulf of Mexico back in the 1980s to today, exploration, production, and transportation in the federally controlled outer continental shelf has shifted quite dramatically. Oil and gas production from wells in less than 1,000 feet of water declined as fields discovered in the 80s and, and even earlier were depleted. Crude oil production in these relatively shallow waters declined by over 90%, both in the Gulf and in, and in off Southern California. Natural gas production in the OCS, which mainly came from these shallow water wells, declined by 80%. Offshore fossil energy project production is now dominated in, deep, in the deep water of the Gulf of Mexico, up to 7,500 uh, feet deep. Deep water production grew by, but grew by 38% just over the last 10 years since the Deepwater Horizon disaster. During these last 10 years, inland domestic production of oil and gas through hydro fracturing has greatly expanded. In fact, since the lifting of the crude oil export ban in 2016, last year there was 78% more crude oil exported from Gulf terminals, exported overseas, than actually produced in the US OCS, and three times as much natural gas exported than produced offshore. So the depletion of shallow water oil and gas resources has left the legacy of active but quite old infrastructure still producing marginal but declining resources. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm, can you hear me? I've lost my uh, Fed, uh, <laughs> WebEx. Could you? Dr. Bosch, we can hear you very well. Okay. So I don't, I don't see the timer. My, I lost that, that on my screen. So I'll just continue. Uh, please, please uh, tell me when I'm done. You have Finished. three minutes and four seconds. Left. Okay. So the depletion of shallow water gas has left this legacy of the, of old wells and declining resources and the infrastructure. Uh, re this requires uh, decommissioning and removal. Much of this in infrastructure was not operate is not operated by the original leaseholders, but by smaller companies with lesser assets and technical and operational capacity. These circumstances present substantial challenges going forward for ensuring safe operations, reliable, reliably sealing wells, and decommissioning unused platforms. Off Southern California, there are 23 platforms in federal waters, eight of which are soon facing decommissioning. In the Gulf, on the other hand, there are 1,862 platforms, and about 1,000 of them will probably be decommissioned within this decade. While leaving the platform, substructures in the ocean uh, through a rigs to reef program can enhance the productivity of certain species. The nation lacks a strategy for platform decommissioning that takes into account the scale of the challenge and comprehensively considers the consequences for ecosystems and living resources and the long-term fate and effects of the material left offshore. Of the 55,000 wells that have been drilled in the OCS, 59% of them had been permanently or temporarily abandoned, and the rest will be at some point. One study estimates that methane loss rate of 2.9% from the Gulf OCS, which is equal to the average US loss rate through the entire life cycle of natural gas supply chain. According to the GAO, 
as you pointed out, there are 8,600 8, miles of active pipelines in federal waters of the Gulf and 18,000 miles of abandoned pipelines. Uh, the GAO found the Department of the Interior lacks a robust process for addressing the environmental and safety risk and ensuring cleanup and burial standards are met. And also monitoring uh, the long-term fate of these, uh, pi these, uh, these pipelines. Myriad active and abandoned pipelines are limiting, for example, the restoration of East Timberlayer Island in Louisiana because of the number of pipelines under near, underlying that island, as well as the use of offshore sand ore sources for coastal restoration. The U.S. is not alone in facing this predict predicament of holding corporations rather than taxpayers responsible for the cost of decommissioning. This August, the Australian Parliament passed legislation tightening decommissioning liabilities and imposing a levy on all offshore oil and gas producers to cover the cost of decommissioning abandoned facilities operated by liquidated companies. At recent rates of pre uh, production, oil and gas, uh, Gulf's crude res oil, oil reserves will be exhausted in only six or seven years, that is the proven reserves. Even with the undiscovered and economically recoverable oil that Boehm estimates in the central and western Gulf, we, could, we would run out of oil about mid-century. So unless some miracle allows us to capture all of the greenhouse gases that would be released, we really can't do that and achieve net zero emissions. Whether it be by resource depletion, governmental or corporate policy or investor and stockholder decisions, offshore oil and gas production is likely to see, see a steep decline. So the greenhouse gas emissions pathway that we follow in how we deal with the legacy and remaining infrastructure uh, will both play out over the next decade or two. The nation sorely needs a smart strategy for this end game, one that both limits climate and maintain climate change and maintains the deleterious impacts and the risk of the residual infrastructure. In my opinion, this strategy must be environmentally sustainable, socially and economically effective for the people of the region and protect taxpayers from bearing the cost of remediation. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bosch. The chair now recognizes Dr. Stuns, and I hope I'm pronouncing it, your name right, for five minutes. Yes, that is correct. Um, good afternoon or good morning for some folks. Uh, Chairman Lowenthal, Ranking Member Stalbert, and members of the subcommittee, um, while oil spills are certainly a major concern, I appear before you today to discuss some of the positive aspects of oil and gas infrastructure as they relate to marine life and recent scientific discoveries with the artificial reef program in the Gulf of Mexico, and more importantly, how they can facilitate some of the decommissioning issues we face in a safe manner. My name is Greg Stuns, and I'm Regents Professor, a professor of marine biology and endowed chair for fisheries and ocean health at the Heart Research Institute at Texas A&M University in Corpus Christi. I direct the Center for Sport Fish Science and Conservation, where a large component of our fisheries research program involves investigations into artificial reefs, and in particular, rigs to reefs, which represent a dominant structured habitat in the western Gulf of Mexico. Their ecological hotspots, and important economic drivers in the sense that they are important fishing grounds. In short, the science from our group and that of many of my colleagues are demonstrating positive benefits of artificial reefs, especially rigs to reefs, in enhancing our marine fisheries, for example, red snapper, amberjack sharks, and many other species. However, the science is simply just refining and validating what we've known for generations, and that is structured habitat in the otherwise mud or featureless bottom can enhance fisheries resources. Um, early on, fishermen recognized that sunken vessels and a variety of other materials on the seabed are quickly colonized and become flourishing ecosystems. Thus, we're not talking about a new concept, but how can we use wise scientific practices to safely maximize and enhance marine habitat? For example, operators in the Gulf of Mexico estimate there's approximately $18 billion worth of infrastructure that's available for reefing. Those involved in any type of habitat restoration are routinely faced with limited resources, particularly material. And that lack of restoration substrate represents a serious bottleneck to that process. But not in this case, the infrastructure here offers habitat opportunity we should miss, especially if we re reef it in a safe and wise manner. Until recently, scientific information regarding rigs to reef has been relatively sparse. However, just in the last few years, 
Congress has appropriated over $20 million in research funding for three separate studies to better understand habitat use of important federal fisheries in the Gulf of Mexico and South Atlantic, particularly as they relate to artificial reefs and rigs to reefs. With this extraordinary level of funding, today's scientists are equipped with adequate resources and the latest technologies to further this science. The new data are showing that these artificial structures provide important fisheries habitat in an otherwise structure poor environment. In fact, these decades old structures hold tremendous amounts of fish biomass and are major economic drivers. A central question is, how do these structures perform in relation to mother nature or natural habitat? And I'm pleased to report that in every parameter we use to measure that success, these artificial reefs produce at least as well or often better than the natural habitat. We observe higher densities of fish, faster growth, and even similar output. Thus, by all measures, um, these data show artificial reefs are functioning at least equivalent on a per capita basis to enhance our marine resources. No discussion on this topic would be complete without addressing this pervasive attraction versus production. While the scientific community is well beyond this debate, the attraction criticism still pers persists, and that is, do these structures simply attract what is already there versus actually producing new fish. And recent evidence clearly shows that these structures, these artificial structures produce new fish biomass. And in fact, attraction and pr versus production are not mutually exclusive, but work together synergistically to produce new fish biomass and enhance production. Interestingly, rigs to reef also attract fishermen. Today's anglers have long fast range, fast range boats equipped with remarkable electronics to locate fish even over the smallest bottom features. There's really no longer secret fishing spot, spots. And without alternatives, anglers are forced to fish natural reefs. Thus, all, all artificial reefs can be an alternative spatial management tool by dispersing that fishing effort away from the ecologically sensitive areas, affording these rare natural habitats a refuge from fishing pressure. And perhaps the most convincing evidence of the value of rigs to reef can literally be seen in person. And I highly recommend anyone diving High Island 389 off of Texas, which is really the crown jewel of platforms. And located in the Flower Gardens National Marine Sanctuary, seeing this underwater oasis in person reveals a structure team with corals, marine life, and other fish. Uh, even in the industry's staunchest critics are becoming increasingly convinced of their value. Um, so, for example, they presently don't condone removal once these sensitive ecosystems have become established and many are in place for over 30 years. So, in conclusion, rigs to reef works are an effective management tool. They produce reduced fishing pressure on natural areas. They're an excellent example of a partnership between oil and gas industry and resource managers, where both the Gulf environment, in this case, economy and public can benefit. However, time's not on our side as we've seen the decommissioning and removal of the largest man-made reef complex in the world is happening at happening an accelerated pace. And um, the opportunity to access this, this artificial habitat is waning. Thus, I encourage Congress and federal agencies to take an active interest to safely ensure that as much of this habitat as possible stays in the water. Thank you for the opportunity to address the committee today and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, doc, Dr. Stuns. The chair now recognizes Mr. Shuark for five minutes. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Shuark. Thank you, Chairman Lowenthal, Ranking Member Stauber, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for holding this hearing and inviting me to testify today. My name is Rob Shuark, and I'm the North American Executive Director of Carbon Tracker Initiative, a nonprofit think tank. Today, I will speak to our research on the decommissioning of oil and gas infrastructure, otherwise known as asset retirement obligations or AROs. When a company installs a platform or drills a well, it creates an ARO, an obligation to reclaim that infrastructure when production ends. This costs money, but companies aren't required to give financial assurance for the full estimated costs today. Money to plug in active wells today comes from cash flows from oil and gas production. But what happens when that stops? The International Energy Agency sees peak oil and gas demand as early as 2025. This will make it harder to pay for decommissioning from future cash flows. Decommissioning is costly. The Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, or BESI, data indicate that offshore AROs could range from 35 to over $50 billion, while financial assurance requirements are about $3.47 billion. 
that is less than 10% of expected liability. The GAO believes these figures may actually underestimate the true cost of retiring the remaining deep water infrastructure. Current regulations have allowed a large amount of idled offshore wells and platforms. For example, only about a third of the unplugged wells in the Gulf of Mexico have shown any production in the last 12 months. Why haven't the other two thirds already been retired? Because of uncertainty as to when to close and poor incentives. Infrastructure should be decommissioned when it's no longer useful. But the regulator has difficulty making that determination. This uncertainty explains why Bessie waits five years after a well becomes inactive to deem it no longer useful for operations, with years more allowed for decommissioning. These delays increase the risk that operators will become unable to pay or simply disappear. We've seen this already with a variety of companies, including Amplify Energy's predecessor, Beta, Vinoco off California, and Field recently with Mexico. There's also a problem of misaligned economic incentives. As it is virtually costless to keep wells unplugged, companies have no incentives to timely plug them. AROs are like an unsecured, interest-free balloon loan from the government with no data maturity. There's little incentive to save for repayment because operators bear no carrying cost and no risk in the case of default. If the ARO loan carried interest payments commensurate with the underlying non-performance risk, producers would be incentivized to decommission non-economic assets. The solution is simple. Require financial assurance equivalent to the full cost of carrying out all decommissioning obligations. This could take the form of a surety bond, a slinking fund, or some other form of restricted cash equivalent. If wells are still economic to operate, considering the carrying cost of financial assurance, the operator will continue production. If not, they'll plug. In either case, the public is protected from these costs. Full cost financial assurance is not unreasonable. Secured lenders require it, and operators often do too. This would also benefit other operators and lessors in the chain of title, given the prevailing joint and several liability regime that exists today for offshore infrastructure. A key risk here is operator bankruptcy that causes liabilities to be passed on to others, and we could see this in the recent field of bankruptcy. Fieldwood was formed in 2012 and in 2013 acquired shallow water properties from Apache Corporation. It went through Chapter 11 bankruptcy in 2018 and then, undeterred, acquired additional deep water platforms from Noble Energy. Fieldwood returned to bankruptcy in 2020. It characterized the de decommissioning costs it shared with Apache as among the company's most significant liabilities. The bankruptcy plan created new companies to receive and decommission certain idle offshore assets. If they failed, prior operators and lessors would have to pay. Several large oil and gas companies objected to this proposal. They were concerned that if field blue couldn't pay, they would. Ultimately, the plan was approved. The case illustrates a few key dynamics. First, if bankrupt companies cannot pay, others, including taxpayers, will. How much of the possibly $50 billion in offshore decommissioning liability is held by companies that are only a dragged anchor, a hurricane, a leaking pipeline, or oil price shock away from default? And second, as detailed in my written testimony, private companies who face liability risk understand them better than the government does. When they transfer well, they demand financial protections that are in fact greater than what the government requires today. In summary, there are tens of billions in offshore decommissioning liabilities but a fraction of that is covered by financial assurance. Operators are neither required to save for these liabilities nor incentivized to decommission in a timely way, so they don't. The government can address all of this by requiring full cost financial assurance. Finally, private operators require far more security than the government does for the same risks, proving that the government can and should do more. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shurk. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Ms. Savitz, Ms. Savitz for five minutes. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Savitz. Thank you, Chairman Lowenthal, Ranking Member Stauber, and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify. My name is Jackie Savitz, and I'm the Chief Policy Officer for North America at Oceana which is the largest international advocacy organization that's entirely dedicated to ocean conservation. 
The recent oil spill in California is another reminder of the need to move away from oil and gas and towards clean renewable energy. Oil disasters hurt coastal economies. Dead birds and dead fish have washed ashore, beaches are closed, and the area is close to fishing. This is the latest in a long and growing list of tragedies caused by the oil and gas industry. Offshore drilling is dirty and dangerous. When they drill, they spill, and it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. My testimony will focus on the need for permanent protection against expanded offshore drilling, the failures of current financial assurance procedures designed to protect taxpayers, and the inadequacies around pipeline oversight and decommissioning. First, Congress must end all new leasing for oil and gas, starting with the Build Back Better Act, including this committee's critical provision to permanently protect the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans and the Eastern Gulf of Mexico from new leasing. This issue has bipartisan support and this committee has taken the first important steps. Second, federal agencies have allowed the oil and gas industry to skirt financial assurances and decommissioning obligations for far too long, as you've just heard. Boehm and Bessie's inaction and oversight failures must be corrected. Supplemental bonds are necessary to protect taxpayers from the risk of spills, but Boehm is overusing the waiver provisions that allow a financial strength test to waive requirements for supplemental bonds. Boehm regulations require that lessees furnish a relatively small general bond, and while Boehm has discretion to acquire supplemental bonds, they generally waive those. General bonds that lessees are required to furnish don't come close to covering the cost of decommissioning and haven't been updated since 1993. Since that year, the cost of decommissioning has gone up, in part because development has moved into deeper waters. Only about 10% of offshore oil production in the Gulf was in deep water in 1993. But by 2014, that figure rose to 80%. Regulations need to be updated to ensure the federal government and taxpayers are not left picking up the tab on decommissioning. According to GAO, only 8% of decommissioning liabilities in the Gulf of Mexico were covered by bonds or other financial assurance mechanisms, with the other 92% waived or simply unaccounted for. GAO found that the financial strength test is faulty and creates huge financial risk for the federal government and taxpayers. Further, financial assurance can't be achieved because Bohm and Bessie are not collecting sufficient data on decommissioning costs, which makes cost estimates inaccurate. For example, the data for estimating pipeline, de pipeline decommissioning costs are mostly based on shallow water sites with more than 28% of pipelines in deep water. Financial assurance starts with an understanding of the risks and that requires sound data collection. Third, Bessie is failing to provide oversight of active pipelines and re relying on decommissioning in place as standard practice. Bessie approved 97% of requests to decommission pipelines in place from 2015 to 2020 which is what left nearly 18,000 miles of decommissioned pipelines in place, obstructing other uses of the outer continental shelf, imposing risk to ocean ecosystems. To make matters worse, Bessie does not conduct oversight over decommissioning activities underway, and it does not inspect decommissioned pipelines, so the Bureau can't ensure that the industry has complied with required environmental mitigation. The leak detection technologies that the oil and gas industry touts as safer have not been proven to protect, prevent major leaks. All pipelines in the Pacific region are reportedly equipped with advanced leak detection equipment, but two weeks ago, we saw exactly what can happen even with the so-called best technology. With Bessie's limited oversight capacity and the industry's substantial economic incentives to prioritize production over safety, it is no surprise that human error continues to be an issue. Congress should pass H.R. 2643, which would direct Bessie to finalize regulations that have been delayed since 2007 to increase oversight on active and decommissioned pipelines. We can't continue to repeat the mistakes of our past. Congress must immediately end new leasing through the Build Back Better Act, require stronger financial assurances, end the practice of permitting abandoned pipelines, conduct strong oversight over active pipelines, and require agencies to take a proactive management approach to properly decommission abandoned infrastructure. This would be a big win for the environment, coastal economies, and U.S. taxpayers. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ms. Savitz. Uh, and I want to thank all the panel for their testimony. I want to remind the members that 
Uh, committee rule 3D imposes a five minute limit on questions. The chair will now recognize members for any questions they may wish to ask the witnesses. I'm going to recognize first Chairman Grijalva uh, for five minutes of questions. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Lowenthal, and thank you for this timely and, and very, very important hearing. Uh, as, as, as you well know, sir, and, uh, as the uh, gas and oil industry clings to every opportunity to, uh, to delay, to uh, attempt to, with different rationale, uh, prevent uh, any action uh, that, that begins to come to grips with the need to transition away from fossil fuel or to deal effectively with climate change, uh, everything is about taking more time. And I think what, what just happened in California should be, is a wake up call. And, and I appreciate the timeliness and, and, and your leadership on, on this issue very much, all of us do. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, Dr. Bosch and Ms. Uh, Savitz, uh, when we think it's fairly, it, it's easy for people to understand how active offshore pipelines can lead to spills that devastate marine environments and coastal communities. It's there, it's tangible, it's graphic. But the threats posed by abandoned pipelines don't have that kind of attention. Uh, those that are not currently transporting oil or gas, they're not much less understood, known about, or appreciated by the public. Can, you, can we talk a little bit, both of you, about the hazards and dangers of abandoned pipelines uh, in the Gulf of Mexico? Well, um, since you mentioned me first, I'll, I'll start, then Jackie can follow. I, I'll just point to two recent um, examples in, in, the, in, the, in the Gulf of Mexico where uh, older pipelines, abandoned pipelines have caused problems. One is, uh, as was mentioned, uh, in Hurricane Ida, uh, there was a, all of a sudden appeared an oil slick and it lasted for a few, several days. And apparently it's traced, it was traced to an abandoned pipeline that had not been fully cleared of all the residual oil in it. So that all that oil leaked out during that uh, during that incident. Another, of course, is a more is an ongoing issue is I think you all know uh, the states in the Gulf are trying to restore their environments, the coastal environments using funds from the BP oil spill, including restoring barrier islands and so on just off the coast of where a lot of this oil and gas uh, development takes place. And, and one island is so understrewn with the myriad of pipelines coming in, most of them, we don't even know where they are or who, who built them and when, that, that it really interferes with the ability to restore that barrier island. Similarly, the resources, the sand resources from offshore, they, the pipelines underlay those sand resources. So they have to be careful about where they dredge them because they don't know exactly where the pipelines are. Those are just two recent examples. Thank you. Those are really good examples, Dr. Bosch. And, you know, I would just say that I think abandoned infrastructure um, can cause pollution. It can lead to navigation hazards or damage to archaeological sites if it's moved by a storm. Um, and oil and gas pipelines can leak oil and gas. Um, and, and we've seen that happen in the past as well. Um, and so I think that um, we need to consider that when we make decisions about decommissioning. So another point that was made with Savitz, uh, we referenced that, you know, rigs to, to, uh, to reefs uh, program that, that the, they provide an asset, they provide a, uh, a biodiverse environment in which uh, fish and, and, uh, and life can grow and that they become uh, the alternative. Uh, and, and so does that, how does that relate, that, that point relate to, to the discussion that uh, the, the point that this legislation uh, seeks to address, and that is uh, to deal with uh, abandoned pipelines, abandoned uh, infrastructure, and, and to make the, the oil companies uh, responsible for that. And, uh, how does that the two relate, if if, if at all? 
Well, I think, you know, I think there may be instances in which um, it makes sense to leave some infrastructure in place, but I think those should be the exceptions rather than the rule. And unfortunately, based on the data that's been unearthed by the Government Accountability Office, it's become very clear that um, our government essentially has made it the rule that decommissioning in place is uh, the way to go. Not technically the rule, but with 97% approval, um, it, that's you know, essentially what's happened. And I think there's enough infrastructure out there and there's enough money behind that infrastructure that we shouldn't just assume that it stays in the water. I, I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much for the hearing and look forward to uh, uh, your, uh, your, your uh, field hearings that you're going to have in California. And uh, thank you for that as well and look forward to the uh, outcome of that. Thank you very much and I appreciate the time. Thank you, thank you, Chairman Grijalva. Uh, I now recognize Ranking Member Stauber uh, for five minutes of questions. Ranking Member. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to all the witnesses for bringing your expert testimony. Uh, we all do really appreciate it. Uh, a couple of uh, quick questions. Um, uh, Mr. Stunts, how would removing all decommissioned pipelines impact local uh, species? Well, thank you, Congressman. Uh, our, we certainly would support proper decommissioning in the terms of uh, proper plugging of the well and flushing of the pipes and that sort of thing. But the structure scientifically is what we're concerned with as scientists because over decades of time, those have developed flourishing ecosystems. In fact, sometimes some it's you know very rare corals and those sort of things. And so we we have issues now. You know we we didn't anticipate that level of fisheries production or or the ecosystems thriving like that when these structures went in. Now we have sort of this scientific issue of well, what do we do because they occur? They're the only structured habitat available. So essentially, you you just remove that habitat. So somehow offsetting that or doing the proper studies to ensure that you know this material won't last forever and, and the marine life builds upon it. And so our science has shown that by leaving that in the water, you can even enhance, but at least maintain the fisheries productivity that you have. And there's a lot of fisheries concerns that if you remove that habitat, you'll begin to deplete the sustainability of, of our current fishery situation. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, Mr. Bosch, you, you're uh, very well versed, um, 30 years. In your time uh, evaluating the industry, has the technology become better and safer as we uh, drill for oil? Yeah, surely, uh, and it tends to, tends to respond to disasters. So I, I, when I was on the Oil Spill Commission, we emphasized the need to improve the safety technologies inspection, and that certainly has been done. One of the challenges, though, is that this older infrastructure is not operating in the same standards and with the same capacity of those of the major oil companies that have to do that. So, for example, when I noted that they detected this methane being leaked, they didn't detect it from the offshore, the new offshore deep water platforms, which have all the right technology. It's in the older, older infrastructure that they're seeing this. Yeah. I think that I think that uh, Mr. Bosch, it, it, that parallels my line of thinking with the mining industry, uh, where there have been sins of the past, and, I've, and we readily admit that across this nation, but we're getting better and better and better at it and, and safer and safer and safer with the technology. I, I appreciate that. Um, Mr. Schuerk, I think that I uh, pronounced that uh, correct. Thank you for your testimony. Can you tell us where your nonprofit is headquartered at? Um, our, non our nonprofit is at 501c3 uh, headquartered in New York City. In where? New York City. Okay. Um, when you when you track carbon, uh, um, do you look at donors to your group, such as um, bill, billionaire Michael Bloomberg? He's a he, he's a funder of your nonprofit. Is that correct? We have, we have, we are funded by a number of philanthropies, uh, yeah, yeah. including no, I, Mr. Schwark, I asked you a question: Is is billionaire Michael Bloomberg a funder of your nonprofit? Bloomberg Philanthropies is. Yes. Okay. So the answer is yes. Thank you. 
Um, and, and do you monitor uh, his carbon and his private jet? Well, in, in what I was going to say in terms of carbon tracking is somewhat a misnomer. What we look at uh, are the are the financial implications of the energy transition, particularly for you, oil and gas companies. Mr. Schwer, do you, does your nonprofit intend to hold uh, your funders accountable as well as the oil and gas industry? Well, what we do is produce research that's focused on the financial implications of the energy transition, rather than uh, holding uh, different individuals or funders or anyone for that matter accountable. Okay, so I, I would just ask this as, as as we go forward. The the uh, I would like you to understand northern Minnesota, for example. We have winters and. The north part of the country, uh, I, I would say, it would be uh, like this. When it's 30 or 40 below for weeks at a time, meaning you, you can throw water in the air and it will uh, become ice before it hits the ground. I need to turn on my heater and get instant heat for our families, my family and others. Do you support that? Yes, in fact, uh, I didn't come to testify on this, but many of my colleagues look into issues about intermittency and how uh, renewable energy will be able to address those in the future. I, I'm glad you support uh, the, the warmth that the northern climate uh, folks need. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your testimony. And back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ranking Member. Uh, I now call upon uh, Representative DeGette for five minutes of questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your comity and allowing me to question. I have another another event I have to go to. I was I was actually listening to the lat to the ranking members questioning, and and I had to I had to look up the title of this hearing again because I got confused. The title of this hearing is Ab abandoned oil and gas infrastructure, but yet the testimony I've heard and the questioning I've heard. It's about how well uh, you know oil and gas development can it can increase fish and um, it can be good and and about how technology has improved and so on. That's not really what this hearing is is about. And one thing I think would be really useful in a bipartisan way is to not try to divert the issue because in fact. We have, uh, and, and, and one reason I'm interested in this, because I'm from Colorado, we don't have a lot of offshore drilling here, but we have a lot of old mines here. And we have a lot of old mines that need to be decommissioned, both onshore and offshore. And if we do that, we prevent methane leakage, we prevent um, we prevent in we prevent oil oil and gas leakage. It's it's a good thing, and it's something all of us collectively in a bipartisan way should be looking at. And the ranking member talked about the sins of the past, and we have better technology now. Yes, we do, and I'm glad we have better technology now. But we still need to think about what we're going to do about all of these old abandoned. Uh, structures that are leaking. And so that's Mr. Schuert, that's what I want to ask you about. You talk about oil and gas companies offshore have a financial incentive to defer the cost of safely decommissioning their infrastructure. And I think you talk about the incentives as a quote, interest free balloon loan. And if they respond as one would expect and find themselves unable to pay and responsibly decommission the infrastructure, then all of us are left holding the bag. And we've been hearing that time and time again also about onshore uh, wells and mines. So my question for you is, is it the same dynamic for on and offshore oil and gas, gas wells? And is there a difference in the policy we should be taking with on and offshore wells? Um, that's a great question. So fundamentally, many of the issues that we see offshore are also present onshore. Um, there's actually one thing that exists offshore, a joint and several liability, that only exists yeah. in certain jurisdictions onshore. So in some ways, the situation onshore is worse uh, because, it, you know, in some states like California, you can go after prior operators if the current operator cannot pay. But in many jurisdictions, you cannot. Um, and our research has found 
that there is about 280 billion in onshore liability and somewhere around 1% of that is covered by financial assurance bonds. So there is definitely an issue with onshore rather than offshore. So what can we do both on and offshore to get the companies to, what, what kind of policy changes would we need to make to, to change it so that they would actually um, pro properly decommission these wells? Well, the issue is just really giving them a financial incentive to be able to decommission. And that means they have to confront the cost uh, of decommissioning and internalize that into their decision on whether continuing to produce from a well is economic or not. And so that means they need to have some kind of financial assurance in place that represents the actual cost. That could be a surety bond where they go to an insurer that acts as a guarantor for that amount. It could be a sinking fund like we have in the context of nuclear where they go start putting money aside at the beginning and it grows over time to be sufficient to plug the well at the end of its useful life. And there could be other forms of restricted cash that they maintain on the balance sheet for the benefit of these liabilities. Thank you so much. I just have one quick, quick question because I met the members of this panel know I've worked a lot on methane waste issues. It's a big problem in Colorado and around the United States. Can you talk a little bit more about the methane emissions from abandoned active wells in the Gulf of Mexico? And should the emission, should the administration work on those as well? Well, I have to confess, I haven't looked at methane emissions from the Gulf, so I don't I, I, I don't have a good answer for you on that. Okay. Hopefully one of the other panelists can Does anybody that. else know the answer to that question on this panel? Yes. Uh... Yes, uh, uh, Congresswoman. Uh, the I'm the, sorry, I was supposed to ask you that question. Sorry. <laughs> okay, no problem. The the uh, the uh, there's very little information on offshore uh, offshore oil and gas and methane emissions. The, there are two studies I cited in my testimony that actually have flown aircraft and made measurements. It's not like you can walk up to a well like on land and take the measurement. You're out over the open Gulf. When you are in deep water, as, 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 uh, as the ranking member uh, uh, indicated, technologies are improved and there's a lot of requirements. So there's less flaring, those kinds of losses. Also, the, if there's any leakage under the water, the methane has to come up through the ocean where it's dissolved and doesn't reach the atmosphere. So the primary concern is the shallow water wells where the water depth is less. And if you have leaks, they could reach the atmosphere and you don't have the technological con constraints. And, and then we used to be doing a lot of flaring of these sites at these sites and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, for your questions, ranking member. I'm uh, not ranking member, member uh, representative to get. I now call upon recognized uh, representative uh, uh, Graves for five minutes of questions. Representative Graves. Well, let's hold, if he's not here at this moment, let's call on Representative Tiffany, and then we'll come back to Representative Graves. Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman, can you hear me okay? This is Representative Tiffany. Yes, I can see you and hear you very well. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity here. Um, I had a couple questions for um, Dr. Stuns. Um, am I saying your last name correctly? Yes, Stuns, that's correct. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. Um, how big of a role does our nation's offshore energy infrastructure play in providing artificial reefs at this point? I think you covered that some in your testimony, um, uh, but if you could address that once again, that would be good. Yeah, well, they play a major role in the sense that uh, we often refer to as the largest man-made artificial reef in the world with the infrastructure that's out there. The industry estimates are that if we had to, to generate that material and take it back offshore to, to reef um, would be worth, let's, in the realm of $18 billion. So it's, it's, it's a valuable resource to be out there if we used wise and safe scientific practices to reef that. The, the science clearly, clearly shows this there's value. And in fact, we create structures out of concrete and other things that we take back offshore to enhance that. So what we were trying to do is offer a solution, a scientific solution for the material that's already there. And we've shown that in many cases over decades, the fisheries have become to rely, the fish and the people accessing the fisheries 
rely upon these habitats to to support those economic drivers. Also, there's high value to to salvage of the steel that's out there. So the companies don't always want to leave it out there because they're you know there's there's in fact many cases it's difficult to to get them to put something in a reefing program because of the value that they have back on land. So because over the decades these have become so important in marine life. Uh, we are looking for ways to ensure that habitat remains in the water. So, Dr. Sons, do you know, um, is, is is this accounted for, for example, in an environmental impact statement? Does a company that is applying for an environmental impact statement, do they get credit for this? I don't know about it on an environmental impact statement, and that's probably a question we'd have to ask industry. I do know when they donate a rig, let's say, to a rigs to reef program, they, they obviously the cost for them is are reduced, but the money that that they're saving goes back into the the program and the science to facilitate the reefing and permitting. It's not an easy process to reef one of these structures, whether it's in place or you're moving it to a um, reef zone where the approvals may not be as high because they're already pre-approved. Many times, for example, if there's a day of, of of cost to move that rig to an approved reefing site. That's all they can afford. If that was the case, they would bring it in because the, all of a sudden, you know, the cost would be too great. I don't know how they account for that environmental impact statement or if it's even done. Most of my experience has been on the back end when it's in the decommissioning process. So, um, uh, if offshore energy or offshore energy infrastructure is removed and it's been there, let's say for a de decade or um, perhaps decades. Um, is that going to do some harm to uh, habitat for uh, those critters that live around there? That's a major concern. Certainly the direct removal of corals and things, you know, they would die. But the habitat value for more mobile fish is a big concern. Our, our recent great red snapper count that Congress appropriated showed literally millions of fish that are utilizing these structures. And in fact, that's where most of the fishery takes place. And in a way, it's a good thing, as I pointed out, because it's sort of preserving our natural habitat. But we're very concerned as scientists, especially in the Western Gulf, that's primarily mud and sand bottom without these structured features that all of a sudden when you remove that, the fish don't have the habitat that they had. And typically in fisheries, the productivity is related to the fisheries productivity is related to how much habitat you have available. So I would just say, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we need to make sure that we're not harming the environment here um, as we go forward, as I have seen this committee, a uh, committee as a whole, as well as this subcommittee charge ahead on all these things that are discouraging energy production in America, that we make sure we're not harming the environment while doing it because we are harming the environment currently when you take and uh, want to stop pipelines from being constructed, as we saw with Keystone XL. We see the governor of Michigan now trying to shut down a pipeline to go through the Mackinac Straits. It's gonna affect all of the upper Great Lakes as well as Canada, perhaps violating a treaty with Canada. And so that oil is now going to go on trains, which will give out far more emissions than a pipeline will. And so while the Biden administration as I like to use one of Congressman Stauber's favorite terms, phrases, hellbent on ending energy independence here in America has done great harm to our economy, is doing great harm to job creation as we lose more jobs. By the way, did you see the August report where over 400, I think it was over 400,000 people have left, left the workforce, highest number in the history of um, keeping those numbers. And it's affecting us in regards to national security where we did not have to be dependent on the Middle Eastern countries. Now, Jake Sullivan's over there begging them to pump oil. So the Biden administration is harming our economy, harming job creation, harming national security. Now, are we going to go forward and actually harm the environment with things like this that are going on, including this whole notion that we simply cannot have any fossil fuel infrastructure here in America. It just all has to go away and everything is going to be just fine. The people of this country are waking up. It does not work and it's going to continue to cause problems until we get grown ups that understand the trade offs that go with this stuff. We can have prosperity and a clean environment. 
They are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they work together. And until this committee, this Congress, the majority in this Congress and this president figure that out, this country is going to continue to pay far more for energy and we will, it will deplete our standard of living. I yield back and thank you for the time, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Stuns, uh, Dr. Stuns, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. That, thank you, Representative Tiffany. I'm sure the president also is very appreciative of your strong support. Uh, now I'd like to call upon, I don't believe, is Mr. Graves here yet? Representative Graves? Mr. S uh, Representative Stauber, I'm gonna continue with Democratic members uh, until the next Republican, but as soon as the next Republican shows up. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, I, Mr. Chair, I did uh, text uh, uh, Congressman Graves and let him know that he was up, so I haven't had a response, so go ahead, thank you. Thank you. Just contact us or the staff and we'll get it. As soon as another Republican comes, we will represent. Now I'd like to call upon Representative Huffman for five minutes of questions. Welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for this hearing. Thanks to the witnesses for their insights. Um, I'm going to bring my time back to a couple of uh, specific questions that do relate to the subject of this subcommittee hearing. Uh, but before I do that, I, I just have to observe that for the past two days, at yesterday's Natural Resource Committee markup and today in this subcommittee, uh, we have heard the full arsenal of uh, oil and gas industry talking points and tropes and canards. Um, and we've heard it in the context of discussing really some baby steps towards holding this behemoth industry a little bit accountable, making it a little more transparent. The bills we were discussing yesterday were not massively transformative bills that would end the oil and gas industry. Uh, they were baby steps, and yet it sounded like the sky was falling. Every little thing we do to ask more of the oil and gas industry to make them clean up their mess means that we're going to be uh, supporting Putin and you know foreign competitors, and we're going to be uh, ending uh, the world order as we know it. Uh, so we're always told that we have no choice, that it is just fossil fuel now, fossil fuel forever. Uh, the ranking member uh, gave a full-throated uh, throated endorsement of the Republican energy view, which is basically drill everywhere and drill everywhere for export. So we put our own beaches and ecosystems and coastal economies at risk so that oil companies can make even more money on the global market. And we're just told there's no alternative. This is the way it has to be. And, you know, we hear all the happy talk about sins of the past and how happy the fish are around all this infrastructure. Um, look, I'm 57 years old, and for my entire life, I have seen nothing but disasters, calamities, uh, deadly workplace accidents, entire communities uh, devastated by accidents. Uh, this infrastructure is exploding and breaking and leaking all over the world on any given day. We talk about what's going on in Orange County because it's very visible and it's in the news right now, but it's happening every single day in lots of places. This dirtiness, this deadliness is just inherent in the fossil fuel paradigm, and we can do better. Uh, despite what our Republican friends keep telling us, we don't have to just celebrate the prettiest horse at the glue factory. There's another way. There's a better way forward to power this global economy. And thankfully, uh, we're starting that conversation here today um, in a really important way to talk about what we do when, when this infrastructure needs to be decommissioned. And um, for my questions, I, I want to keep an open mind uh, to be pragmatic, um, but also hold the industry accountable for its commitments on decommissioning. And we, we tend to talk a lot in absolutes, categorically. Do we remove all of the infrastructure or do we leave it all in place because someone thinks that the fish are happy around this infrastructure? And I, I guess I wanna start with Mr. Stuntz. You described some infrastructure that seems to be providing some important ecological services. I appreciate the fact that you also clarified that as it is decommissioned, um, even though you think a lot of it should be left in place, you got to make sure it's absolutely capped, that nothing is leaking, that the pipelines are flushed. Thank you for that. But I want to understand 
you're not saying categorically that every piece of fossil fuel infrastructure should be left in place everywhere uh, instead of being removed, are you? No, that is correct. We, I mean, certain certain air th certain structures are more relevant to fisheries. Certain structures should probably be brought in. So it's not a one size fits all sort of situation. However, the science clearly shows there's high right. value for certain. No, I, I understand your your point about some of those structures, and I want to keep an open mind for certain cases where it might make sense to leave some structure in place. Uh, but Mr. Bosch, I'd like to come back to you um, because um, you know I'm trying to imagine some repurposing of some of this infrastructure that might, uh, as we transition away from fossil fuels. Uh, do things like provide wind energy. So, you know, talk about the possibilities there. Could some of this infrastructure, you described thousands of platforms in the Gulf, for example, could some of this be repurposed into providing clean wind energy? Could some of the pipelines that service those structures be repurposed as conduits for electricity transmission? Yeah, there, there's active discussion of wind power in the Gulf of Mexico even, and, uh, and including discussions of using of existing infrastructure. There's also industry proposals to use some of that infrastructure and that capability for carbon capture and storage. For example, Exxon's had a, a large proposal. I don't want to necessarily pass judgment about whether that's a good thing or not, but I mean, it, it, it has, we have to think about these uses of this for the future. And just to the point that Dr. Stuntz made, I, I think this he makes some good points. I think my concern is is the long term and at scale. You know, we, we we've been managing these platforms sort of one at a time. We have to think of what's going to happen over a hundred years when all the iron melts, all the, uh, rusts away and disappears. What's the long term consequences of this? Well, where, where, where do we use this? A very troubling point? picture of of a lot of deadbeat companies that appear ready to shift their decommissioning costs onto the taxpayer. In just a couple of seconds though, um, I have seen some, some uh, interesting studies about deep sea desalination where at a certain ocean depth, the osmotic pressure can actually power uh, reverse osmosis membranes and create fresh water without any uh, electricity needed. That's 40% of the energy cost of desal. Could you imagine uh, possibly using some of this infrastructure uh, for deep sea desal and repurposing some of the pipelines to actually carry fresh water. Is that uh, a crazy I idea. Have, I have to look in that, but it, but at least that that's that's a possibility for the deep water platforms, which go down to those deep water depths and cold temperatures and so on. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, Rep Representative Huffman, I don't believe I've been looking on it that Representative. Uh, Graves has joined us yet. If you have joined us, let me know. All right, not hearing from Representative Graves. I am glad to now call upon Representative Levin for five minutes of questions. Well, thank you, Chairman Lowenthal. Uh, as I discussed during yesterday's markup, last week's oil spill off the coast of Orange County has once again highlighted the need for our country to change the status quo when it comes to offshore drilling policy. The first step that we need to take is common sense, and that's to end new offshore oil and gas leasing in Southern California and off the Pacific coast. The Build Back Better Act would invest in the long-term protection of our coastal communities by doing just that. But addressing new leasing is not enough. We need to re-examine re the existing leases off of California because as long as dangerous oil and gas infrastructure is there, it will continue to pose a significant threat, not only to our environment, but to our economy, an economy, coastal tourism, coastal recreation worth billions of dollars in California. Now, I recognize that dealing with this problem will not be easy. Decommissioning is expensive, and it'll certainly face opposition from the fossil fuel companies that profit from drilling activity and their allies who benefit from continued extraction. They'll take great pains to distort the facts and mislead the public about the respective risks and benefits. And sadly, we've seen this deception before. But make no mistake, this endeavor is absolutely necessary for the well being of our local economy and our environment here in coastal California. And it's broadly supported by our coastal constituents, Republicans, Democrats, independents. This is not partisan here in our coastal communities. So I appreciate that I have colleagues that are uh, here to share my desire to address this problem. I look forward to working with you closely. 
And with that, I'll turn to some questions. Ms. Savitz, the pipeline oil spill off the coast of Orange County that has uh, had severe consequences on our local businesses and communities was the result of federal leases sold by the Interior Department decades ago, clearly demonstrating how these leases can have long lasting impacts years or decades after they're sold. Do you think we should continue to sell more of our public oceans to the oil and gas industry? Thank you for the question, Congressman Levin. As you know, um, Oceana opposes any new lease sales um, and has been um, vocal on the need to permanently protect the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the Eastern Gulf, um, at least for a start. Um, we know that oil um, will spill if we drill. We know that it affects coastal economies, as you said, whether it's restaurants, hotels, dive shops, surf shops, fishing, commercial fishing. Um, there's a long list. It costs billions every time that happens. And um, the obvious other piece of it, of course, is that oil and gas are driving climate change. And that's something we need to stop. Now, remember, there is no shortage of offshore oil and, and gas opportunity for the oil industry. The oil industry is sitting on so many, um, uh, nearly 8.5 million acres of unused or non-producing leases, 75% of the total leased acreage of public waters, they, they're sitting on it and not using it. So even if we ended all new leasing, it would not end offshore production. Thank you for that. Dr. Bosch and Mr. Schuert, both your written statements express concern that financial assurances held by Bessie are a fraction of expected offshore decommissioning costs. Uh, Mr. Shurik, you suggest the number is as low as 10%, could be even lower than that. Are either of you concerned that if the Interior Department starts requiring more upfront collateral, it'll drive more oil and gas companies into bankruptcy and lead to more orphaned wells and pipelines? I know that's an argument that some make when it comes to decommissioning platforms off Southern California. Sure. Uh, maybe, maybe if I could take a shot at that one first. I mean, I think one thing that's important to note is if if you have a company that already has an existing financial obligation to plug a well, decommission the infrastructure, and it says, I cannot afford to do that. I cannot afford to acquire the financial assurance that I'm gonna be able to do that in the future. Then you've got a company that maybe is not gonna be, is not gonna be able to handle that obligation already. It's just, it hasn't gone to bankruptcy yet. It's already a problem. That's the first point. And the second is, that problem is not gonna get better with time. That problem is gonna get worse with time as production from whatever facilities they currently have decline. Um, it's gonna get worse from time from the taxpayer standpoint because you will lose other predecessors in interest that would possibly be able to fill in if that operator couldn't do it. Um, it will get worse uh, simply because it becomes, uh, you know, it becomes infrastructure degrades and so on and so forth. Um, and so I would say, yes, there is some risk, but this is a thing where you have to at, at, at tackle it right now. It is only going to get worse over time. So that's the first point. The second point I would make is if you look at the field with bankruptcy, what you see in the case of Apache, which transferred uh, a number of these assets to Fieldwood to begin with, is they acquired far more financial assurance from this entity that ultimately went bankrupt than what the government is getting today. They required a trust. Uh, that had to be filled with at least $80 million or the equivalent in decommissioning being done every year. That trust had to be replenished up to 125% of the expected decommissioning costs that, the, that Apache would face if it had to handle the work. So it was more than fully protecting itself. And this is one of those late in life entities. And I think the point, the lesson here is you don't really know whether people are going to go bankrupt or not in this situation. What you do know is that you need to protect the interests of the taxpayer. Well, we're over time, uh, Mr. Chairman. If I could briefly hear from uh, uh, Mr. Bosch on this uh, topic. I think, I think uh, uh, my colleague is, is, uh, has answered it in more detail than I could in more, with more expertise. So I'm fine with what he said. Well, I appreciate you both. I will remain committed to ending new offshore uh, drilling in Southern California, and I will do all I can to move forward with decommissioning as well. And as I said, I know it won't be easy. I know we have powerful interests against us who like to distort the facts and create a false narrative to line their own pockets, but I will not stop until it's done because that's what our constituents in coastal California demand. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you, Representative Levin. Uh, Mr. Stauber, I don't believe Chair, Mr. Chair, I, I was told uh, 
uh, Mr. Graves will be on shortly if he's not on already. All right, let me see if uh, Representative Porter is here. Representative Porter, are you here? If yeah. not, we'll wait. I'll, you know, I'll do my. I am here, sir, but Mr. Lowenthal, you can go first if you'd like. No, no, I'm gonna wait, uh, Representative Porter. Um, thank you. Uh, I have questions for uh, Mr. Shork. What percentage of oil and gas leases on the outer continental shelf, which we commonly refer to as offshore leasing, are not producing oil and gas? Well, the numbers I, I provided for today's hearing were re really related to uh, overall, and it was basically two thirds of them, uh, the wells, looking at the wells. So the okay, so about two thirds of the wells are not producing oil. Um, they're not contributing to energy availability. They're not changing consumer prices. They're not creating energy independence. They're not producing. They're just sitting there. Now, when an oil company stops drilling offshore, do they immediately take away the platforms, the rigs, the wellheads, the artificial islands, the power cables, the pipelines, so that nobody can tell that the oil company was ever there? No, they do not. So... I have a question. Does the lease require, these are federal leases. Um, this is our public land. Um, do the leases require offshore oil and gas companies to, when they're done drilling, to remove all equipment and permanently plug these wells? So what the leases require, so, so when they cease production, they have basically one year Shane. to do that. Or okay, so when they uh, cease uh, production, they're supposed to decommit, we call that decommissioning, where they remove, they're supposed to remove the equipment and permanently um, plug the wells. Um, the GAO has said there are about 38, there's about 38.2 billion in estimated decommissioning costs um, for the Gulf of Mexico alone. Do those companies have enough bonds and um, dedicated financial instruments set aside so that regardless of the up and down of the whatever their company's making, we can be sure that they'll be able to pay those decommissioning costs and taxpayers won't be on the hook? No, what, what our review of Bessie data shows is that they currently provide something less than one tenth and it could be uh, of the total uh, amount expected. Uh, cost. Okay, so I think what you said is about, it's about 2.9, I like numbers, it's about 2.9 billion. Let's just give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's round up to 3 billion, but there's about 38 billion of potential costs. So companies need, we're counting on these oil and gas companies to have the, the profits, the cash to make the investment to clean up when they're done. Have they been doing that? Well, typically what we will see, the, the answer is not really. Typically what we'll see is well-to-do companies will transfer these assets into other entities uh, that have less financial means and wherewithal to actually conduct the cleanup. So they're moving, once they've taken the money and they've made the profit, then they're giving away, they're basically transferring away the unprofitable, difficult, expensive part of this, which is the decommissioning portion. And they're transferring that, are they transferring that to big, healthy companies? No, often they're transferring it to companies that didn't exist even uh, just you know, prior to the transfer. So they, You mean a shell yeah. company? Uh, yes. Like an entity created just for the purpose of pushing off the cost of doing business so that you don't have to pay it even though you've got all the upside? Are you saying that this is what oil and gas companies do? Uh, we, we've seen this, yes. And how does the law facilitate this? Uh, well, how does it facilitate it? Well, I, I suppose in a, on a couple of levels, uh, on the one hand, uh, there's very little oversight of the transfer. Uh, and so there's very little restriction from a regulatory standpoint. This is true offshore and also onshore. So we see this behavior in both, in both places. Um, and then secondary to that, uh, the, there is uh, actions that companies can take in bankruptcy that can effectively pass these liabilities on to taxpayers eventually. And so uh, some, some of it is to be able to use that in the event the new company goes bankrupt. So I was a bankruptcy law professor before I came to Congress and I taught business law. And a lot of these, these laws about allowing companies to, to create sub entities, to sell assets, to file bankruptcy when they're in financial trouble. They exist for really good reasons, but they also can be abused. 
And the entire, and we, and the result of that is we, the taxpayers, having given oil and gas companies our oceans, our public lands, our wildlife, our, our nature, our planet, to make profit end up on the hook if they take advantage of this scheme of this legal scheme and these you know, transfers, um, and then they put us on the hook for that. Why shouldn't we have higher bonds and make sure that no taxpayer is on the hook for cleaning up a mess that another company profited from making? No, 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 certainly no private actor would do what the federal government does, which is not have a security for these risks. So, so taxpayers are being asked to take on risks that private companies wouldn't. We're giving the oil and gas companies a bargain deal here in terms of offshore liability because we're not, we're not asking them to indemnify, to protect us, to have bonds, to make sure we're, we're saying, take our public land, take our water, in this case, drill, and if at the end you want to hand back the mess to us, that's okay. That's currently what the government's doing. That's effectively what is happening, yes. Well, that is not acceptable to me. I don't think it should be acceptable to anyone on this committee, regardless of party. If there's going to be offshore drilling, and there currently is, then, you know, one of my favorite phrases is, you buy the ticket, you take the ride. You buy the ticket, you lease, you take on the oil and gas company lease, then you take the ride, and that includes paying for the full cost of decommissioning. And that's exactly what I think the federal government ought to be requiring of oil and gas companies is protecting taxpayers when they want to benefit from the taxpayer's property. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Thank you, Representative Porter. Uh, I believe I, I don't believe there's anyone else here at this moment. So I'm going to, unless someone jumps in who I haven't called on yet, or I'm going to ask um, and take, ask five minutes of questions myself. Uh, Dr. Bosch, uh, as a former member of the BP Deepwater Horizon Oil Spill Commission, you know, I mean, an unbelievable amount about offshore drilling regulations. Question I am and what, what has come up especially since the uh, oil spill in California, is that the federal government already requires pipeline leak detection technologies and regular inspections of pipelines in the Pacific, yet we still experienced a disaster that led to the release of thousands of gallons of oil in the ocean. So I'd like to kind of understand from your point of view, potentially what went wrong. But the more concerning to me is, and there are only, I believe, 200 and some odd miles of pipelines, and yet we require the oil uh, the oil companies to do their own internal inspection. And I believe it's, uh, I don't know if it's Bessie or Bone does the external expect, expect, um, uh, 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 external observations and oversight of these pipelines. And uh, whether it's internal or over or external, it's done every two ye every year. Well, every two years the external, and every two years the internal. But they're done in different years, so that there's some oversight going on all the time every year. Dr. Bosch, are you concerned that of the thousands of miles of active pipelines in the Gulf, there is no subsea monitoring or oversight? Yes, first of all, there, there is a requirement for pressure sensors to see if there's a leak in the Gulf as well as in California. Uh, and, but there's no requirement for routine inspection of the How pipeline. come? Uh, well, it's Why a good is there question. routine inspections? It's in a good the question. In, in, uh, in 2007, the Minerals Management Service, before Boehm and Bessie were divided, uh, had draft uh, rules that were they were they were proposing to promulgate that would require more advanced technologies for pressure sensing and de leak detection and 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 uh, monitoring of pipelines, and uh, they, they were released in draft but never executed because of the industry concern about cost 
feasibility, those sort of things. So they never got uh, never got for. I, I we didn't look at that particular regul that rule uh, in the Deepwater Horizon Commission, but we did look at the similar rules uh, issued about the same time for, regarding drilling safety. And the same thing happened with those. The the Minerals Management Service proposed these rules. It was pushed back. They never got. They ne were never executed. And so it was, in fact, after the Deepwater Horizon blowout that some of those proposals were actually implemented. But it took that that kind of but an took, accident. But it took that. a Deepwater Horizon crisis to implement some of those rules. Right. But there were other rules that were just to regulations for public safety. Uh, pipeline safety, security that were just overlooked. Just the oil and gas. They, company. There was opposition. They did. They weren't executed. Was there any support from the communities around there who were most impacted by the oil? You know, the one thing you have to understand in the Gulf, it's it's not like California. There aren't a lot of people living along the beach. People don't see it. Number one. Secondly, it's a very important part of the economy. Uh, it creates jobs. So, so there's a different, different view and relationship that's, that's held there. Uh, but the, the main thing is, is, I mean, it's, it's, it's largely out of sight, you know, it's well offshore. It is no one, you know, not a lot of people are living right along the shore. So it's really a different climate than, than in Southern California. Thank you. Doctor. It's an important part of the economy as well. So that's important. Right. No, I have visited. I agree. I agree. I truly do understand that the difference is in terms of the importance to the economy mm -hmm. that, that oil and gas have. I was just wondering if you, in your experience, had there been any opposition by people in the community? But I, I, I understand that last point that you make. Mr. S Ms. Savitz, yesterday our committee passed H.R. 2643, the Offshore Pipeline Safety Act. My question is, do you think the enactment of this bill will help prevent future offshore pipelines offshore pipeline disasters and protect taxpayers from having to pay for the removal costs? Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for that. It's very important that your bill becomes law because it would certainly help. The Department of the Interior has been sitting on a rule that would improve oversight of pipeline operations since 2007. And your bill would require that rule to be finalized, including requiring third party inspections of active pipelines, more modern leak detection equipment and ongoing monitoring of decommissioned pipelines, which, you know, we've talked a lot about today, uh, all being things that are simply not happening now. Thank you very much. And I'm going to yield back and representative Graves. It's good to see you and you are now recognized for 5 minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, join y'all and, and love to hear all these people talking about the. The, the Gulf Coast, um, I, I might be the only one who speaks in space. Can Gulf you Coast speak up? It's hard to hear you, Representative Graves. Sorry. I said, hey, it's it's uh, it's great to see y'all, and I appreciate the opportunity to join. Um, and I hear all these conversations about the Gulf Coast, and that's actually the area that we represent and, and live in South Louisiana. So um, uh, this, is, this is home, and I appreciate everyone's interest. Uh, a, a lot of things... You know, kind of get distorted in translation a little bit. And I think something that's really important, Mr. Chairman, that, that, that you and I discussed yesterday in committee is that uh, Deepwater Horizon spent a lot of time in the courts listening to the judges, reading the judgments. And, and something that's really important to keep in mind, uh, Dr. Bosch, you know this, the, the, the judge found that the responsible parties uh, were grossly negligent, that, they, that there was willful misconduct. And and so what that shows is that is that this was an operator that was way out of bounds. If they were if they did everything right and it was just some accident, then they wouldn't be forty billion dollars out of pocket. They wouldn't have been found grossly negligent, which nearly quadrupled the civil punitive penalties that they were forced to pay. And so I I I, I think it's really important that we keep that in mind. Secondly, something that's important to keep in mind. Is, is that as we saw under the Obama administration when there were efforts to effectively um, uh, reduce the amount of domestic energy production, it didn't have an impact on supply. Excuse me, I got that backwards. Um, it, it did have an, it, it, the, the demand didn't get changed. It, when, we, when we 
choked down on supply or domestic energy production, it didn't change the demand for conventional fuels. It just changed where it came from. And, and I believe Dr. Bosch noted this before, the, 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 the offshore actually has the lowest emissions um, uh, from any production in the United States. We have the lowest emissions. And so, so if we're going to produce anywhere on the globe, it might make more sense to do it in areas where we do it safely and do it uh, within the rules. And when people don't do it within the rules to where they are held accountable uh, to the tune of tens of billions of dollars, which I remind everybody was the largest settlement from a single company in U.S. history. Um, let me go over, uh, Mr. Mr. Schwartz, you made comments about Fieldwood Energy. Quick question for you. How much of that liability that you noted is, is on the backs of taxpayers? Well, we we don't know how much is going to be on the backs of taxpayers. The result of that, I, I can answer the question. Yeah. None, because because you have because you have other responsible parties that are contractually obligated Not to, to cover those costs. Yes. And, and in fact, they're really pissed off about it right now. But, but that's how the law works. Look, this is no, where I live. That's not true. The people that we represent. No, it is true. It is true. You have other companies that are contractually obligated. Go look up what Apache's doing in other companies right now because they're pissed off that they've got this stuff around their neck right now. So there, some, some of that, that, that is true, but there are also the, some... that, the, that, the, that the National Pollution Fund Center is funded through barrel taxes that is paid by the industry. So, so, so these are dollars that are coming from the industry and you're gonna have folks that are held liable for that. It, it, none of the liability is on taxpayers right now. So, so I think it's important to, to get that out there. Dr. Stutz, thanks for being on. I'd like to ask you um, uh, the, the role, the Great Red Snapper Count, for example, the role of the offshore energy in terms of habitat for some of these species. Could you just talk about that a little bit and if it's beneficial or, or if we should just remove it all? Uh, thank you, Congressman Graves. Yes, the Great Red Snapper Count showed literally millions of pounds of fish that are using these artificial structures especially in your region and further in the Western Gulf of Mexico, where we don't have structured habitat. In fact, there's evidence now suggesting that our fisheries population would not be as robust as they are now or have the same sustainable capacity if we didn't have these structures. And I mentioned earlier, certainly we want safe infrastructure out there, but we need to have these structures in the waters to support those fisheries. And, and that was the primary conclusion of the study in terms of of where these fish occurred and what habitats they using. Oil and gas infrastructure is very important to those species. Thank you. And I know I'm running out of time, Mr. Chair, but just want to throw a quick question to Dr. Bosch. Dr. Bosch, look, you, you and I have known each other for a long time, and, and we've had a lot of discussions about the offshore and coastal Louisiana. Just, just, and, and I know that you love science and, and you believe in it. Recognizing global energy demand going up 50% over the next 29 years, recognizing that we have some of the lowest emissions uh, uh, per, per unit of energy produced in the Gulf, looking at what happens around the world with energy production. Do you believe that we should just shut it all down? Or do you believe that there's a, a better way to move forward toward a clean energy transition? Yes, of course, you, we can't shut it down. We depend on fossil fuels for the time being, but we need to we need to get off of it. We need to have less reliance on it. We need to, as you have pointed out many times, we need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, essentially eliminate them ultimately. And so using more renewables, using less fossil energy is is the pathway going forward. I would commend to you the, the International Energy Agency's analysis on how we get to net zero, because it does talk about the future of fossil fuels. It does recommend no new fossil fuel developments by countries, but it also recognizes we're going to be continuing to use the resources that we already have. But it's got to go down and it's going to be reduced. And, and I think someone pointed out a, a, a new uh, International Energy Agency report just today, just yesterday, said that th their estimate, and this is an agency which is not an environmental agency, it works closely with the industry, that peak, peak fossil fuel production will be 2025 and then it'll go down. So my, my point in the testimony was we really need to understand what that means for the Gulf. We, we need a safe Gulf, we need a, we need a good environment, and we need, a, we need a ramp down in a way that doesn't hurt people and communities and provides us the energy we need. And in the end of this period, 20, 30 years, we have a healthy Gulf, uh, as well as um, uh, avoiding a global disaster with, loss, with uh, uh, greenhouse gases. Growth, continued growth of greenhouse gas emissions and 
and missing the target of getting the net zero. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Bosch. And I want to make note that same IEA is the same ent entity that said that the U.S. transition to natural gas has resulted in the largest decrease in greenhouse gases in energy history. Um, and so certainly need to continue building on our successes and learning from our failures. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Representative uh, Graves. And I thank all the witnesses. I found this very engaging discussion and, and, and very important discussion. And I thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and all the members for their questions. The members of this committee may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we will ask you, the witnesses, to respond to them in writing. Under Committee Rule 3.0, members of the committee must submit witness questions within three business days following the hearing. And the hearing record will be kept open for 10 business days for these responses. If there is no further business. Mr. Chair? Yes. Mr. Chair, I just want to commend you on holding this hearing. There was uh, some of us, including myself, that went over a little bit, but those are important questions or comments. And I want to uh, just say I appreciate your flexibility, and I know our colleagues on both sides of the aisle do a very nice job today. And I yield back. Thank you. And I think it's really important that we get to hear each other, to use this as a mechanism and not to shut off any person. And I mean, obviously, there, there may be some, but I thought all the questions were relevant and needed to be asked. So with that, if there's no further business, and I thank you, Ranking Member Stauber, for your comments, this subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you.